Right. Okay. So very good evening, uh, one and all. Um, welcome to this uh, first uh, session of uh, Taste Survivor uh, for the Section 2 FRCS exams. Um, can, uh, Dr. Bill Arba, can you mute your thing, please? Let, let me mute you. Because it's, yeah. So welcome you all for the first session of the Taste Survivor for the FRCS Section 2 exams. Um, so we'll be having this session uh, this Sunday, next Sunday, and the Sunday coming after uh, the next one as well. And the whole aim of these three sessions is to um, show you how an FRCS Section 2 waiver exams would be. Yeah, And it's just to give you a taste of um, what depth of knowledge you would need, how the timings are, and how your attitude should be, and so many things. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the aim is we we are planning to um, uh, have three different faculties for these three days, and the topic is not focused on a particular subject, but it will be a general topic um, covering some different aspects of the general surgery curriculum. And uh, what we need is, I means although there are like 30 plus registrations, we have only eight at the moment, but I'm hoping that few will join. The, the session will run for two hours, and for today we have uh, uh, Mr. Natarajan Agamuthu, one of the colorectal surgeons from Royal Free Hospital. So he will be uh, leading the show today, and we have different faculties for the coming weeks. Um, and also, this is mainly to, um, to start our main course, which is uh, beginning on October 22nd, which runs for three months. And usually this is something like a warm-up session for the course participants who have registered for that course, actually. Uh, but at the same time, we have plenty of international candidates and candidates who are giving a similar kind of exams from Middle East. They also have registered for this uh, exam today. So um, what I want from the participants is to come forward. Yeah, If you have any questions, you can raise the hands and the faculty will be interacting with you to tell or ask questions and clear your doubts. Similarly, um, whoever wants to participate, raise your hands and our faculty will name the particular candidate and he will run the show. And given the fact that we have only few uh, uh, participants at the moment, utilize this opportunity to answer more waiver. But as we move on, I'm hoping that few more might join. Yeah. Uh, over to Natarajan Angabutu. Hi, everyone. Uh, has anyone given the exams before? Yes, I have given it. You good? Okay, fine, fine. So, for people not given the exams, this is quite a challenging exam to get through. Not because we don't know the subject; it's mostly because we don't know how to present it in that short period of time. The key thing is you'll get multiple faculties talking to you about multiple things. But what I think is most important is. When you go for the session, just don't go with the idea that you are a breast trainee, you won't get another case for the bowel. I'm a colorectal trainee, I won't get from the breast. Uh, my long case was CS stomach as a colorectal trainee. Uh, the breast team, uh, uh, one of my breast colleagues got a colon as a long case, so it can change. So be, be prepared because anything is fair game for the examiners which comes into the curriculum. There's a huge volume of subjects to be known about and always have a systematic order of answering the question. And the most important, probably the most important point is to know that how long your timing is for that particular topic. The long case is 30 minutes. You sometimes you have, for the short case, you got five minutes into three. So for the examiner to mark you and say that he or she is good enough to be passed five, six, seven, or eight, you need to complete the scenario and not get stuck at history alone. At the same time, you can't jump from history to examination quickly. So you need to have, find the balance properly. And most of the time, the examiners are that help you. They don't mislead you. If you're not on the right track, they'll probably interrupt you to take you down the right pathway. You may find one or two stations quite tough or challenging because you're not expected it. And don't be disheartened by that station alone because you have to move on to the next station quickly. So always have a higher order of thinking as to what to say, how to phrase it, and talk like a day one consultant here. They won't make you feel confused or take you down very complex scenarios. Yeah. 
unless you're on the very wrong track, they will not interrupt you suddenly at multiple times. You may find one or two examiners as very harsh. I think they do it on purpose to just come across as a as a challenging examiner or, or a difficult examiner, but there's nothing personal about it. And I per se, money might agree, we didn't find any difference between a trainee and a non-trainee because the examiners don't know whether you're a trainee or a non-trainee. So it just all starts. If you're stuck with a particular question or a scenario, just take a few seconds of breath, maintain eye contact, and see if you can fall back to your very simple core steps of what you do in daily practice. If you draw a complete blank and you can't move at all, then say, I'm really sorry, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm not able to get forward. So you can't use a phrase too many times in the same scenario, but just you can use the bailout. And most examiners know very well about the subject, and you can't try to sort of overdo things or be smart with them. Yeah. All right. So I've got a list of very basic topics to start with. Who wants to go first? Can I try first? Uh, yeah, yeah, Amy, welcome. So glad. Thanks for volunteering. Yeah. This is a very simple uh, scenario, Amy. You are a day one consultant. Your time starts now. You're a day one consultant. You're running a day surgery list. You got a 19 year old gentleman with learning difficulties who has a problem. The problem is your registrar has used a consent form four to consent him. But the anesthetic, anesthetic consultant says he's got capacity. You need to change your consent form one. What do you do now? OK, um, so in this case, um, I I believe um, this is my own patient. Yeah, yeah it's your uh, own patient. Yeah. So um, in the clinic, I have signed a consent form for, for this patient. I think it's due to some grounds that uh, I've done an assessment on the patient. And also, I have talked to the next of pain, as well mm -hmm. as the relatives. And also, I have already assessed the capacity, uh, whether the patient can retain the information I told uh, uh, him about the operation, mm -hmm. the risk, whether he understand or not. I think it's based on all the assessment um, uh, before I signed the form for consent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your consent form has gone missing, oh. and your registrar did a consent form four, seeing your notes. But the anesthetic consultant is challenging you, telling that this patient has capacity. You need to change the consent form one. What mm -hmm. What do you understand by capacity to consent, Amy? Um, capacity of consent has several components. Mm -hmm. um, most important is uh, that the patient can clearly understand the indication procedure and the risk of the operation. And also the patient can make the decision and also retain the information by himself. So if the patient has this capacity, then I would say uh, the patient is fit for consent form 4-1. Uh, okay. Consent form 1, yeah. Okay, fine. So now, what do you understand about M Mental Capacity Act in this relevance? Um, Mental Capacity Act is um, some regulation applied to our daily practice, especially to the NHS patients, in which we, before any major decision, especially surgery for any patient, we have to make sure that the patient has the capacity to uh, make the decision. And we will assume that all the patients will have this capacity until proven otherwise. So if this patient has the capacity, we will proceed to the surgery with his or her decision. However, if we are dealt with this capacity, then we need other uh, assessment for this uh, for the decision uh, before we proceed to the uh, operation. So, um, so for this patient, I believe, uh, first of all, I will discuss with the anesthetist as, um, as a team brief uh, about the, uh, the anesthetist concern. And then I will assess the patient again 
together with the next of kin and uh and also i will see if i can find another colleague who uh, i can also um discuss the case with fine uh, yeah. your, your honestly concern is quite a senior consultant who says mm -hmm. your patient has got autism with a very mild form of learning dis disability mm -hmm. he can't speak properly but he's able to understand everything so he says the consent form four is wrong you can't proceed you have to change to consent form one what do you do So I will first um, assess the urgency of this operation first. Mm -hmm. For example, if this uh, operation is just an elective operation, not, not really something emergent, I may hold this operation first and then have, um, because I guess uh, for a multidisciplinary meeting and discussion will take time. And I also don't want to delay other operation on the same list. So my plan is I will withhold this operation first, explain to the patient and the next of kin, and then I will conduct a multidisciplinary meeting. The next of kin is very angry because mm. of the autism disorder. They take a lot of time to organize the mm. transport to come to the hospital to be starved, and the patient will get quite distressed if you don't mm. go to the operation. What do you do next? Um, I would also check the record whether this patient has any uh, has any guidance or documentation about the capacity before. Right. And, have mm -hmm. you have you had any training in your trust related to how to handle patients with autism or learning difficulties? I'm sorry, I have no. Not. Do you know of any mandatory courses which are related to it? Uh, Yes, I know there is some mandatory course that we have to take. Okay, uh, do you know uh, the name of it or? <laughs> okay, fine, uh, I'll, I'll stop you there, yeah. I, okay. I don't want to make you very uncomfortable. So can everyone switch on their uh, videos, please, yeah. Thank you. Guys, I would request everyone to switch on your cameras because you know it becomes yeah. more interactive when we can yeah. see each other and talk rather than just talking to a blank yeah. screen. Right, team. Uh, how many of you find this a difficult scenario to get across? You can raise your hands. Yeah. Have we had such a situation or? Good, you've faced it. Yeah, good. Right. So. Sometimes the scenario is very difficult because you don't anticipate it. So always fall back to what you normally do. Yeah, Fall back to concern form one, concern form two. So this scenario is not about knowing how much Amy knows about everything. It's basically to see whether she's a team player, whether she compromises patient safety, if at all, whether she knows the limits, whether she can work as a team, taking suggestions from other team members, or she stands her ground, whether she cancels patients unnecessarily, or whether she's got the insight to look into the case. So basically, in a scenario like this, you'll often find a schizophrenic on medications. You'll find a patient who's confused on the day of surgery. You'll find a patient dementia coming for surgery or endoscopy. These are the common ways the scenario goes down. So you'll be asked about concern form one and four, so all you need to be remembering is parts of the Mental Capacity Act, which Amy knew the first part of it. What capacity means, who can assess capacity, how capacity fluctuates, and what are the guidelines around it. When you're handling with someone with autism, autism does not mean that they have no capacity to do things. They can have everything except a very mild form of learning disability, which is more of interacting with people, they can talk very well sign languages. They can do their normal life. They can have a normal work, but they are socially in adaptation is difficult. So the key things you fall back on is, if the anesthetic consultant has raised a question, then there may be a, an error in my assessment. I would like to recheck my records here. Yeah? Just go through your records. And I would like to talk to the patient. Autism patients do not like busy areas, do not like too much of noises. So I'll ensure that the patient is in a 
private area in a, in a room which is comfortable for them. I will look for their carer or their regular next of kin because they know most about the patients, how they interact. What is abnormal for you will be the normal life. So they'll know them better. Mm -hmm. Most of the patients with autism disorder learning difficulty has a, have a health passport. Just say, I look at the health passport. Do they have any advanced directive? Then I will use my communication skills, which I learned on a mandatory training. I think for the exam point of view, at least you know should know a little about Oliver McGowan training for handling learning difficulties, patients. It became a very national issue. It's part of mandatory training now because a patient with autism went through multiple episodes of medical negligence and the and the child finally died. So a teenager. So that led to a national campaign for to rectify. And it is now part of mandatory training. So just know a little bit about what it means. Always fall back. If you don't know anything at all, just say that I would consider the views of my anesthetic consultant, reassess the patient myself. If there is a if I feel the patient has good capacity, I might have made an error of judgment in the clinic and I would accept a change to a form one. If you still think it's form four only, then I would reason out with my anesthetic colleague. If it's taking too long a time to start, then I'll get my other colleague to come in, postpone this as a second or third case while the issue is rectified, and then carry on with the list. So it's basically to see how you adapt to that particular situation here. Mm. Good. Any questions Thank from you. anyone? Thank you. Yeah, can I can I can I add a few things, not right? So yeah. Emmy Cock, you did well actually for the for, for answering for the first time. We don't know, we haven't seen you before, but seeing you for the first time, you did very well. Okay. First, let me tell about the good things. Okay. So good things is you were very, very patient. Yeah. You listened to the question completely and you answered only the appropriate things which is needed for that particular question. You were not going here and there. You were maintaining your eye contact. Yeah, the attitude with which you are answering was very good. Your voice was so clear and legible. Okay. The second thing which could have been better is, you know, so in the exams, the first is exams, you know, as I always say, so when you are already eligible to give the section two exams, it means that you have attained that knowledge actually. So most of us have the knowledge to give this exam or clear the exam, but the key is, what you need to tell for a particular question is the key which makes you whether you clear the exam or you fail the exam. Yeah. So you will know so much, so many things, but you need to concise it or you need to tell only the particular thing which is relevant to that particular question. So that is where the training comes and that is where the practice comes. OK, so you should not talk too much when time will just run away. At the same time, you cannot tell very little where you have not expressed what knowledge you have. So you should have the balance of uh, uh, it's an art where you can tell in a very short time whatever knowledge you have gained so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another important thing when in such scenarios, which it when it comes when you don't know anything, especially when it is around this um, uh, clinical governance thing is your primary aim is to be very, very safe to the patient. Yeah. Patient mm -hmm. safety is your primary concern. And even if you don't know what is it, you have to tell that patient safety is my primary concern. At the same time, other patients should not be affected. At the same time, your harmony with the other team members should not be affected. So you take the responsibility, you move back, let the other cases flow. You speak to your colleague, okay? You speak to your colleague senior, or you can speak to your clinical director, or you can speak to your clinical lead, express the situation, and then you come back and make a plan. Yeah? But for for, for the first time you're answering to our knowledge, you did very well, actually. You will clear, the, clear at least this scenario, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Amy, for this scenario, you'll be a safe path. You'll be passing the scenario. Yeah. I wouldn't fail you because you knew what you're talking about. You didn't venture into doing something which is harmful for the patient. You didn't challenge your anesthetic colleague saying that you're wrong, all that stuff. You, you knew what consent form four and form one means. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both. Good, right. good, good. Thank you, Amy. Okay. So who wants, who wants to, go, wants to next? go next? Okay, Dr. Ravindra Guger, Guger. Yeah. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Ravindra. I think Dr. Ravindra is giving his exams. Uh, he's giving his international FRCS exams in the coming. Yeah. Year, okay, actually. fine, fine. So can you hear me, Ravindra? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Right. Okay, fine. So you are appointed as a consultant in a district general hospital. 
you're doing your first outpatient clinic, which is general surgery clinic. You've got a three-year-old child referred to you, and the GP letter is just one line. Please, this is, please see this child for problems with the foreskin of the penis. What do you do? Child is there with the, both the parents. I'll take um, um, I'll take the uh, focus history from the parents. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, uh, since uh, since birth or since last few days, this foreskin is not retractable, or uh, any any other problem. This uh, child is uh, uh, any other problem the mother is facing. Uh, while carrying the child, uh, like uh, she's finding the ballooning of the foreskin, or any any recent time child has got a fever, uh, fever which might be GP diagnosed as a urinary tract infection or anything, and uh, I'll just take the little obstetric and uh, uh, postnatal history of the child whether it was a uh, uh, it was a, um, a normal delivery, uh, any. Uh, uh, any other complication related with this delivery uh, and um, uh, uh, then uh, I asked the other concerns uh, to the parents uh, why uh, why they are uh, they, they want to go for the circumcision of this child and then I'll examine with the consent of the parents I'll examine the child uh, I'll uh, along with the general examination I'll just uh, focus on the examination of his genital as. Uh, whether they are well-formed genitals, uh, both testes are in a scrotum. I'll check for the uh, penis, uh, and I'll just gently try to retract the foreskin and see uh, how much tight it is. Uh, uh, and I'll just rule out whether it is a physiological uh, phimosis or is a pathological phimosis. Okay, the foreskin is easily ret retractable. Yeah, there's very very mild inflammation of the prepuce. Yeah but no lymph nodes, both tests are normal. Basically, you find the extrinsic to be normal in this child. Yeah. Uh, simultaneously, I'll look for any, uh, if it is foreskin is uh, properly retracted, I'll look for any the hypospediasis uh, the child has. Um, um, Everything I, is completely normal, Dr. Ravindra. No, there's no hypospediasis. Penis is normal. Yeah, then uh, I, I'll uh, ask their concern, uh, uh, I'll ask about their concern and uh, advise them the treatment, uh, which form of some local steroid ointments uh, to apply for time being. And uh, it uh, if this inflammation uh, in the form of barren prostatitis, it may settle down and the foreskin will totally uh, come back. The GP had the given creams earlier to your consultation and the parents now say we want a circumcision for our son what do you do uh, uh, definitely if the uh, if the foreskin is uh, totally uh, completely retracting i'll consider is a non therapeutic circumcision for this child and uh, i'll consent the uh, if the parents are ready i'll consent them for the uh, this non therapeutic circumcision i'll explain them of the advantage of this procedure and some disadvantages of this procedure advantages like will be it will be like a local hygiene cleanliness can be maintained some urinary tract infection can occur and very rare chances like it can act as a uh, it can prevent a malignancy of penis also uh, but simultaneously i'll uh, tell them the cons like uh, it is a so i'll just stop you there you use the term non therapeutic circumcision what are the indications for circumcision uh, uh, circumcision, most child, common, yeah. yeah, most in a child, most common circumcision is for religious purpose, uh, 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 pathological phimosis. Sorry, sorry. Uh, circumcision, religious purpose. We are talking about therapeutic indications. Yeah. Non-therapeutic circumcision. No, I'm asking about therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. Therapeutic. What are the indications? Yeah. Thera therapeutic circumcisions are. Uh, uh, like a, a recurrent attacks of balanoprostitis, recurrent attacks of urinary tract infection, uh, uh, phimosis, uh, phimosis. Uh, um, uh, I'll remember this. Okay, fine, good. So, what are the NHS guidelines regarding offering circumcision when there is no medical indication for it? 
uh, if it is done for religious purpose, I think it is not funded by NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, fine. The problem is, if you say no to this patient now, the parents are taking going to take the boy to a religious practitioner and get the circumcision done. There's a chance of the child can get harmed. What will you do now? I'll explain them to not to go ahead with the such practices. Uh, the dad gets very annoyed. Dad says, against my religion, not to have the circumcision for my son. I want it done. What will you do? Definitely, with the consent of parents, I'll go ahead with the circumcision for the child. Your hospital doesn't allow you to do that. I don't have any idea. For okay, fine. I'll stop you there, everybody. Ravinder, you did really well. You started off well because I think you didn't anticipate the scenario well. You started off well. I would say just start, well, focus history is the right word to use for short cases. I would look at problems for maturation, recurrent UTIs, ask the mother if there's ballooning of the foreskin during maturation, or does the child pull at the tip of the penis? All these are indicators that there could be something wrong. Yeah. Once you finish that, give a little pause for the examiner to ask you or give you some findings here. Then you move on to examination. When the examiner says everything is normal, exigently is normal, then it's little not needed to go back and say, I'll look for uh, other things like cordy or deformity or hypospadiasis, all that stuff here. So the moment the examiner says everything looks normal, then automatically you say that, this may be a case of religious circumcision, which is being pushed by the parents. Yeah. So here you're tested on your knowledge, not on your medical knowledge of how to do a circumcision. It might go down pathway, but I stopped you there and brought you back to what I wanted you to talk to you about. So in this scenario, you should know about the therapeutic indication of circumcision, uh, any cancerous change in the foreskin or a suspected cancerous change in the skin. Unretractable hypospadia, uh, so, uh, phimosis, episode of paraphimosis, then uh, balanitis xerotica, and chronic balanitis, which is resistant to medical treatment. So all these become medical indications. Of course, trauma is part of it. When you come to non-therapeutic uh, circumcision, it is mostly for religious reasons, very rarely for social reasons. The problem is, in the NHS, non Therapeutic circumcision is not funded. At the same time, sitting in a clinic, you can't bend down to the wishes of the parent that you will offer them. At the same time, you should not allow them to go to a religious practitioner wherein the child care or life can compromise. So what you should do is, I will have a dialogue with the parents or discussion. Just say about the pros and cons of medical circumcision. This child, in my view, does not need a circumcision. However, I would not hurt your religious feelings. If you still need to, it needs to be done in a medical setting rather than a practitioner in a small place which is not fit for circumcision. So when they ask you who can do a circumcision, it need not be a doctor. It can be a non-medical practitioner, as per the NHS, but who's trained, who is fulfills all the criteria to continue practice so that they have all their records and all these things. If at any point the child has got a medical condition which puts him at harm for getting an anesthetic or the circumcision, then you can apply for special funding to get this. So child has got hemophilia. The risk of bleeding is very high. So this patient, although it's non-medical, should be done in a hospital setting. and you do that. At the last point you can say that if the parents still want to go i would ask them to go to a private practitioner who does it regularly and has got a good track record in a certified unit so here you're tested on your knowledge about phimosis and all that stuff but also how you handle the patients how you don't give into a request which is not uh, in in practice you know a little about what what is done what is not done how you keep the patient, the child's safety as paramount, and then how you get out of the scenario. All right. Yeah, thank you. Any questions?
Yes, Atria, yeah. Uh, hi, sir. So I just wanted to ask in a scenario like this, if especially if you have a difficult parent, uh, would you involve urology or pediatric surgery for a second opinion to convince the parents or a, a meeting? Would that be yeah. an appropriate answer as well? It would be appropriate if the examiner pushes you. The parents are still angry. They were demanding it. And it's still on the, you're stuck in the same place. The, the key thing is not to say that I'm a breast trainee. I don't do circumcisions. They know that you can't, most of us can't do sometimes, but they want to know the principles guiding around it. Right. So all you can say is if the pay, if I'm reaching, if I'm not reaching an agreement with the parents and I'm delaying the things, I would set, set up another consultation with my senior colleague who does it routinely or fix another appointment wherein I can see the child along with the senior colleague. Or I would, since I'm not sure how to handle this or not, or not come across the situation before, I'll refer to my urology colleague. And okay. always give the parents an assurance that they're not left alone yet. OK, thank you. Anything money you want to add on? Yeah, I mean, in these difficult situations, you know, instead of telling you don't know, yeah, always simple thing and the simple answer, which is always right, is I will ask for help or I'll speak to my colleague or I will refer to the national guidelines because it means having this kind of a situation for a for a say a colorectal surgeon or someone else having coming with a pediatric patient uh, where the where the parents wants to do a circumcision, you wouldn't come across such scenarios quite often. So it is not uncommon for you not to be aware about this at all yeah so simple thing is speak to your colleague refer to the guidelines you can openly tell that rather than telling i don't know what to do yeah that's very very important yeah and this kind of scenarios having a child as a patient and parents coming and interacting and questions around it is very very common for the frcs exams imagine the same situation atria can i ask you questions now atria imagine the same yeah, situation okay so the kid is a nine-year-old kid yeah nine-year-old kid and the parents are bringing okay uh, telling that patient the, the kid needs a, a non-therapeutic uh, circumcision yep the kid doesn't have any problems yeah and parents want a non-therapeutic circumcision what will you do how does that differ from uh, ravindra's uh, scenario where it's a it's a two-year-old child or a three-year-old child how does it differ having a nine-year-old kid and a three-year-old kid Again, I would start with uh, symptoms, uh, go through whether recurrent UTIs. Uh, yeah, that's all done. So that's all done. Patient, the kid doesn't have any symptoms, but okay. the parents wanted their kid to for a circumcision, have a circumcision. Um, I guess it would it would uh, again be for religious purposes alone, mm -hmm. uh, and. Again, I would uh, if it if it is strictly a non-therapeutic circumcision, I would advise in a similar manner, uh, stating that it would not be in the best interest of the child, uh, as it is not medically necessary. But again, if they are uh, extremely sincere uh, or keen in going ahead with the procedure, then again, I would advise them about the pros and cons. And if they are still so persistent, that's fine. So, whom will you obtain the consent from? So if the child is, uh, yeah, if the child is nine, then if the child completely understands the procedure and is uh, still com uh, uh, has capacity, then technically you can uh, uh, take consent from the child as well, as long as he has Gillick's uh, competence. Imagine uh, the child says that I don't want this procedure. And the parents are pushing you to do the procedure then you would have to take uh, as long as the uh, the child shows gillick's competency you would have to go in favor of what the child says over the what the parents say especially since medically uh, the facts are more in favor of the child uh, or the child's decision mm -hmm. imagine the same situation the child has come okay and you examine the child and uh, the child has chronic um, balanopostitis yeah and you think that patient the kid therapeutically needs a circumcision yeah and the kid is nine years old and you feel that the kid has the good knowledge to process and tell uh, his wishes yeah <laughs> and the kid is telling that i don't want this procedure you are very much convinced that the kid is really competent but the kid is telling i don't want the procedure but the parents are pushing you to do what will you do? 
all right so in that case i would uh, first uh, try to bring the child to a more comfortable environment uh, identify who he is most comfortable with if he's comfortable with the parents keep the parents as well i might request a senior pediatric colleague also to be in the room while i have a discussion with the child to try and uh, one keep the child calm and and uh, explain to him clearly what is in his best interest and see if he changes his opinion uh, and it, then if he agrees then i can go ahead with the procedure the kid doesn't agree okay uh, if the child um, does not agree and he is gilly competent uh, and seems to have capacity then unfortunately i will not be able to proceed immediately but i will request a um, a senior colleague if uh, uh, for for advice and um, again probably try to have a discussion later on uh, when probably because the child is in pain and he is quite anxious he may be a little hasty in his decision probably in a different environment uh, he might be uh, more suitable and probably treat this particular episode of of balanopostitis and hopefully uh, when when he is uh, less symptomatic we can we can rediscuss and then proceed for a circumcision okay after. imagine the same situation same situation okay let, let, i'll come to the answers later same situation the kid is brought by the 9 year old boy brought by his parents to the a &E with bleeding pr profuse bleeding pr okay and the patient the kid's hemoglobin is say 60 and you want to do an emergency colonoscopy okay and the kid is completely gilly competent yeah you are explaining the pros and cons of having the colonoscopy and the kid is telling that I don't want colonoscopy. Even if I die, let me die. I don't want a colonoscopy. What will you do? Okay, so uh, again, yeah, in that case, uh, I can have a discussion with the child uh, uh, but and say that it is not in his best interest. It is potentially life-threatening, but if he's still not agreeing to it then i will have to escalate it uh, to to another senior colleague um and, there's no uh, senior if... colleague in the middle of the night 12 o'clock what do you think a senior colleague will tell you imagine if the senior colleague is telling you okay don't don't worry about whatever the kid says you go and do a colonoscopy will you do no you can't so Okay, fine. So you let's have to let document us, let us really in the notes that this Yeah, is by the time you document all these things, the, the kid's hemoglobin will drop another two grams and the kid will die. Yeah. Okay, so so this is again a very, very common scenario for your exams. Okay, gilly competence. Yeah. So gilly competence, you should means you can divide the gilly competence into two sections. One is an emergency situation, another one is an elective situation. Okay, in emergency situation, a, a kid with gilly competence can tell only yes. To the procedure okay the kid even if the kid is competent and if you think that it is against the best interest of the patient and if it is an emergency yeah the kid can never tell no yeah so you can go ahead with whatever is the procedure if the kid says no explain the parents obtain consent from the parents and you go ahead if the kid says yes okay obtain the consent from the kid you go ahead in an elective situation the situation is different yeah again if the kid says yes no problem at all. If the kid says no, okay, you cannot go ahead, okay, even if it is uh, um, against or for towards the best interest of the kid. So the next step is you discuss again. You can ask for help. Yeah, if there is a if there is a serious dispute between the parents and the kid, okay, and you couldn't make a decision, then go to court, okay, or you appoint an IMCA. Okay, mm -hmm. and they will come in, investigate, and they will take the decision on behalf of the kid. Yeah, so this is how it differs. Yeah, am I right, Natraj? Anything to add in this? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the key actually is for kids, they can say yes, but it's optional if it's a life saving procedure. If it's a clinic, you always reschedule a visit with a different consultant, give them some time to understand. And you can talk to them later. They'll probably come to terms with it. If the parent says no, and you can, you think that's in the best interest of the patient, then you go ahead with the colleagues, the other colleague in what, and you can even go to the court of law to get that permission to save the child. Yeah. This commonly comes with PN, uh, TPN support for kids. 
mm -hmm. uh, when the parents are Jehovah's Witness and the child is still not signed a form or there is no documentation for the child to say that, yes or no. So that you get into some controversy regarding these situations here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Veel Ramadan, you had any questions? You want to ask questions? Um, I was going to ask about the Jehovah Witness in case of yeah. the child. Yeah. So yeah. what if the child himself said no for blood transfusion, let's say, and his mom and dad, his parents said no to, and I wouldn't wait for a court to give me an opportunity to transfuse him because he is bleeding. So what is the step I can do now? There, Vahil, you should stand your ground. If you think in your best interest, the parents are Jehovah's Witness, the child is not signed any form, or child is still under 18, in the best interest of the child, you can give it. But always use a safety net of speaking to the rabbi. The, pa the parents will know them better. Okay, You can get to get them involved. Or your colleague who is a pediatrician on call, or another consultant. And then transfuse. Document as clearly as possible about your reasons why it should be done and what you think. And unless you have a colleague who totally disagrees with you, you can stand your ground in the court of law. Yeah. Thank you. Good. I think right. we'll, let's, let's move on. Who wants to go yeah, next? Yeah. OK. Mahil, OK, good. So Mahil, are you a colorectal trainee or? No, I'm not I'm not training. But I'm okay, training good, colorectal. So, you're doing a two-week target clinic. You get a GP letter. Please see this patient whose fit test is positive. Calprotectin is 500 and CA is 10. OK. Yeah. So, tell us, yeah. Tell us what do you mean by calprotectin? OK. Um, to be honest, I don't know the right answer for the fetal calprotectin. So, OK, um, fine. But maybe it's degradation of the product of. Yeah, when uh, have you heard yeah. calprotectin? Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, most okay, probably. Fine. High fine. Colitis and Do you expect it to be high or low in inflammatory bowel disease? Expect it to be high fine. and high okay. inflammatory bowel disease. Fine. fine. Is it sensitive and specific or it's only sensitive? Um, I think it will be sensitive yeah. okay. to inflammatory bowel disease. Fine, fine. How, how, how is this test done? Is it on a blood or a different body pro fluid product? Or? It's a stool sample. Most of okay, the good. So there you go. You got your answer over here. Yeah? When you get into a scenario wherein you don't know what it is, just stop for a few seconds. Just know what you what. Just talk about what you know. Cat prediction is a fecal marker. It's very sensitive. The levels are high in patients who got inflammatory bowel disease. It does not prove that the patient has got inflammatory bowel disease, but it's high in patients who got inflammatory condition of the bowel, commonly IBD, acute appendicitis, or even colitis, infective colitis. It is used as a surrogate marker to make a reference or to assess disease progression okay. or disease pathway. There you go. You got your answer there. Fecal calp. Just know these things because you might get in a five-minute scenario. It will start like this and go to something else. But if you get stuck in that, then you get you can't move forward yet. So what do you understand by fit? It's a fecal immunochemical test. It's Good. used to detect any micro blood within the stool. Mm -hmm. And it's normal level till below 10. And if it's above 10, it means that there is micro blood within the stool, which means that we need to go ahead with further investigations in most patients. OK. Are the levels same for symptomatic and asymptomatic patients? And uh, no, like it, it depends upon. So, if a patient is symptomatic and having BR bleeding, it, it doesn't mean that um, he has, uh, if he has blood within the stool, mm -hmm. it's quite will be uh, within the stool, but it doesn't mean that it will show positive. Okay. If, if, if it, Are you aware of any guidelines not. based on fit for referral pathways? Yes, it's uh, used for two week weight referral colorectal clinics. 
in which we use it to determine which patient will go ahead with flexible sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy and maybe OGD if both came negative, so to decrease the load over the NHS from the view of the waiting list of the colonoscopy and the, and the flexible sigmoidoscopy in detection of cancers. Okay. What do you do if the patient has got a fit value less than 10? You said 10. So um, I'll just discuss with the patient first, know his uh, history. Uh, mm -hmm. If I can examine the patient, I would examine him, including digital rectal examination, and then see what is his symptoms. And uh, if it is below than 10, then unlikely to be um, uh, on the two-week weight pathway. Uh, so I will go ahead most probably with investigation, like if the patient has symptoms, which are quite obvious, uh, I'll go ahead with CT abdomen pelvis. So the last the last test with the GP has done was uh, the CEA levels. Yeah, what do you understand by CEA? Carcino embryonic antigen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's used for detection of cancer of bowel uh, and cancer colon. So mm -hmm. it's a tumor marker, which mm -hmm. is used in the blood to do it to determine the uh, level of um, uh, tumors and uh, also it's used later on for progression of the disease and see how is the response for treatment. Okay, fine. Is it is it mandatory for GPs to do CA levels before referral? No. No. Okay, fine. Okay. So this patient is in your clinic. Tell us how, how will you proceed now? So uh, first of all, I will uh, take a brief history from the patient about his symptoms and uh, about his, uh, if there is any loss of weight, any uh, GI bleeding, any uh, family history of cancer bowel, and um, uh, any other GI symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, constipation. Um, as I said, family history, knowing his age, uh, knowing other risk factors. Yeah. Um, and then um, I will examine him properly. And I will do an uh, abdominal examination, general examination first, uh, make sure he's stable. I'll do abdominal examination, including digital rectal examination. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then I'll check his UFIT test. Fine, I'll, I'll stop you there, Wahil. Yeah. Yeah. Wahil, this scenario was designed as a five minute scenario. Yeah. And in reality, we've come to the meat of the discussion, and the time is over. This commonly happens in the exam. So don't get worried if you're cut off. The exam will say, I'm sorry, the time is over. We'll go more to the next scenario. It means okay. sometimes you, you have questions which come in as a surprise. Somehow you should bat it out. Yeah. Don't get stuck in the middle of things. See, tell us, tell what you know and move on to the scenario. I interpret probably for about 45 seconds to tell you more about it, but that has to bring you some answers here. Yeah. What I didn't want okay. you to do is start a scenario and say that I don't know about this. So it doesn't look nice when you say, I don't know about calprotectin. So then you can't move on to the scenario. So the examiner doesn't know you, you don't know the examiner. And the, the questions, the answers are written down there. So just have some box standard, simple answers to common things, what you do in daily life as, 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 a, as a surgical reg or as a clinical fellow or whatever grade you are in. So common things. Calprotin will be asked about. It It may not be the whole topic. It'll just a topic to get you onto something else. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good. I wanted uh, any of your colorectal trainees here. Anyone is colorectal in this group? Hi, Amy. Yeah. Amy, can you tell us are you aware of any pathways for fit in terms of referral? I I just know in my trust, mm -hmm. um, the GP has a guideline. For example, if the patient's uh, fit is more than ten, mm -hmm. and and uh, and and then actually it will be referred to our two week way pathway, mm -hmm. and then we will see the patient uh, do the triage. For example, assess the age. Um, assess the other parameters like hemoglobin level and also the performance status of the patient and then mm -hmm. we will decide the next step to go whether is a the the, the options of the I'll lower just, I'll just stop it there amy yeah. what i meant was 
Mm. There are ACBGI guidelines for fit pathways. Mm. For symptomatic patients, 10 and above is a cutoff value. The mm. GP can refer. Okay. What I wanted to say was, if the fit test is less than 10, doesn't mean that you ignore them. Mm. So still the GP can refer if he or she is concerned with a particular symptom that the patient has got. Mm. So the way to answer that is, there are ACBJ guidelines for fit in terms of two-week pathways. Symptomatic patients, more than 10, they can be referred based on fit alone. Mm. Patients less than 10 can be still be referred by the GP if they have got ongoing concerns. Mm. Right? For yep. asymptomatic patients, the fit test is taken as above 120 to go them for the bowel cancer screening programs. So just read a little bit about these things because if you're correct, you'll be asked about these pathways in the clinic. Yeah. Mm. Right. Good. Thank you. It's not a problem. So um, Wahil, since we stopped your who who sorry, who's who was uh, sorry, patient? that that was me, sir. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, good. One, one, one doubt. Um, yeah. Supposing you have a scenario where um, a patient has had uh, documented colitis and they've done a fecal calprotectin that is elevated. Uh, in terms of when would the fecal calprotectin be valid uh, after the the episode has come down? Is it is it uh, two weeks or uh, is there any specific guideline? Could not really. Is, basically, the fecal calprotectin is a protein marker. Which is which is found in the neutrophils of most adult cells. Right. The moment there's inflammation, especially in the colon, all the neutrophils migrate there, and when the colonic mucosal cells are shed, they get into the stool. Because calprotectin is very stable, it stays there and gets high. So that's why you should stress that fecal calprotectin is a marker to prognosticate or to assess severity of disease, but not to diagnose it. Not to diagnose. Yeah. Okay. As soon as the bowel symptoms settle down, yeah. in about a week or two, they go down to normal. Yeah. yeah. So you should know the cutoff. I think it's 90 or something like that, the values. Just know, or 50, 50 micrograms. 50, 50 is in my trust. Yeah, 50 micrograms or something. Just know the values properly, and then talk about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, AJ, you don't need to call anyone, sir. Yeah, all of us. Oh, are yeah, sorry. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you want to go next? You're not finished, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Yeah, good. Right. Again, very simple one. You are appointed as a day one consultant in a trust, and they give you the task, say, actually, go and improve the day surgery project pathway. We're not happy with what's happening. So, how will you proceed now? Um, so, I would um, like to consider this in a sense, as a quality improvement uh, project. So first, I need to um, assess the data, and I would go physically. One, find out what are the statistics of uh, uh, the day surgery unit uh, at present in terms of number of cases done per day, uh, the efficiency, uh, including number of leaves, etc. cetera. Uh, and then after that, have a discussion with multiple members of the team, including doctors, anesthetists, um, as well as theater staff, find out what are the areas that could potentially be improved upon. Uh, so once in, uh, make an initial report of what the present situation is, uh, after that, um, having a discussion as to what potentially could be improved and preferably presenting that at a clinical governance meeting, uh, taking appropriate uh, uh, ideas from senior members and then formulating a proper plan as to what is the most practical and relevant uh, topics and methods to improve it, and then uh, subsequently implementing it, and then re-auditing to see uh, if those measures have actually improved or not. Mm -hmm. This is how uh, the gist of what I would uh, uh, do to implement. Fine. So actually, you, you've got most of it right. Sometimes you get these scenarios which shows the leadership skills. Mm -hmm. It's and and uh, and pure non-clinical stuff, so you need to be able to talk to you, talk to it for at least for three to four minutes without interruption, because okay. it's a five-minute scenario. They'll okay. stop you somewhere. So the key to start is your answers were right. I would accept it. All the points you said. As a day one concept, when you get in, when you take on a project as big as this, you can't do it on your own. All right. So I would first check who was leading the day surgery pathway. So every department will have a lead for colorectal cancer, lead for general surgery, all these things. Yeah, who was doing the day surgery? 
Right. So I'll sit with, talk to him or her, what are the problems the unit is facing, OK? Then I would get my registrar and SHA to do the current audit of what the day surgery pathway is doing. Then I will look into the basket case of the British Day Surgery Association, what is qualified for day surgery, what is being done, what is the turnover time, all this stuff. Then you say, I will set up a meeting with all the stakeholders. The key buzzword is stake. Used one buzzword, you use the quality improvement, which I like it because that's the way the topic goes. The next buzzword I was explaining stakeholders. The moment you say, I will set up a meeting with all the stakeholders, which means that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The stakeholders will be the anesthetic team, the nursing team, the existing day surgery members who are there, then one of your junior doctors, the service manager, a patient representative, yeah, and then even estates will come in because if you need to do something, you need to find a place to do it. For example, they say you would like to do a placement clinic for day surgery or improve the beds. You need facilities and estates there. So these are all the stakeholders. And the moment you get that and say that, I will look into what is happening currently and identify the areas where the turnover time can be improved. It can just be simple as a leaflet or a nurse-led discharge process mm -hmm. or selecting patients for day surgery, do all that. I would look into the get it right the first time website. Those are the buzzwords I was expecting. Yeah? If you, these are scenarios you don't need to worry about your clinical knowledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. You get it, you score as much as you can. Yeah? Uh, you use all the key phrases. I will visit the get it right the first time website, which talks about centers of excellence doing simple things to get it right. right. And I'll take the learning point from that. I would visit the National Day Surgery Unit, which is well repeated to know how it functions and what lessons we can take it from there and get it to our team. Then you implement it a pilot phase. I will get into the project and key anesthetic member. It can be a consultant or a a nurse colleague and a surgical registrar to look into the key components of it and then re-audit your measures, what you put, you said re-audit yeah? and then see how to improve it. I would present this at the audit day meeting and then continue the cycle of improvement until we reach a good optimization. Yeah? So by the time you talk, say, about this much, they'll stop at somewhere and ask you a slightly different question and you finish the scenario. Yeah? Right. So be prepared for scenarios which look very simple. Don't read too much into it. It's, it's, it's like a blank canvas. You can paint as much as you want if you get topics like that. So, right, good. So who wants to go next? Who has not had a chance? Uh, right. So Ahmed, can you hear me, Ahmed? Yes, yeah. I hear you. So are, are you a colorectal trainee, or what's your speciality? No, I'm bre breast. <clears throat> breast. Oh, breast. OK, good. OK, fine. So. <clears throat> Ahmed, you're doing an emergency right hemicolectomy for a cecal perforation, which comes on your own call. There's some bleeding in the colonic bed. What do you do? Colonic bed. Uh... The retroperitoneum, where the colon is attached. Yeah. Okay. It, it depends on the. Uh... Just I, I I want to know how the patient's vitals and uh, the from the anesthesia was the anesthesia about the your anesthetic colleague has said the patient is stable. Carry on doing what you're doing. He he okay. he's not worried about the patient at this point of time. Yeah, it uh, depends on the size of the bleeding and uh, uh, it's it's retroperitoneal. So if if it's contained and. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not uh, increasing, enlarging, uh, not pulsating. So I will just, I will just. Uh, mm -hmm. Fine. You've done, do a, you've, done, you've done a very good job of getting all the pedicles ligating it. There is small bit of oozing coming along the ureter and the gonadals where you mobilize the colon. It's not a big spurt or anything. Yeah. It is just persistently oozing. Yeah. I'll, I'll just put it back uh, okay. for a while. 
and Good. make sure that the patient is stable and uh, if if the if it is stopped so that's it so i don't need to deal the patient is again. stable so how long do you want to put the pack for Ramad? Uh, uh five minutes okay so you pack for five minutes. minutes you take off the pack and slowly it starts to well up the oozing is still along the fresh tissues which you mobilized just next to the ureter what do you do uh, i will try to explore this area mm -hmm. uh, meticulously and to see where, where is the source of the bleeding okay fine there are there are at least five or six points of bleeding which are arterial which is just along the periuretic tissue around the berry ureteric ureteric tissue on the right ureter yeah okay uh, i will i will put it back again and and, mm -hmm. and just uh, wait for another five minutes uh and and see what's the response your 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 nurse is telling you've tried packing do you want to try something else i can get it for you what do you do i will ask her what what what, what you want to get what, what you what you yeah suggest yeah she, she's got surgery cell lots of surgery cell in the cupboard yeah yeah i can use surgery cell or okay. uh, yeah okay, whatever okay. hemostatic material available around or yeah. sometimes powder yeah, how, how, how does surgery cell work, uh, Martin? <clears throat> it is hemostasis, but I'm not sure about the uh, the, 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 action, the, the actual action. Okay, fine, fine. As a surgeon, I don't want to go into you to go into too many de details. How does how does hemostasis come? Uh, how does blood clot basically? Yeah. Uh, the the injured uh, endothelium uh, of the blood vessel uh, the platelets accumulate and the clotting factors accumulate on the area of the of the injury okay fine so apart from surgery cell are you aware of any other hemostatic agent altostats mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, there is a powder but i am i am not familiar with the name of the powder okay okay fine Anything else that you know of? Uh, no, not uh, not in my mind now. Okay, fine. So, because you're doing an emergency operation, it's a septic patient sickle perforation. The anesthetist is telling you that it could be sepsis-related coagulopathy. What do you do next, Ahmed? Uh, I want to make sure that the patient uh, had given the uh, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, yep. uh, you were you given you were given uh, tazobactam. Patient was not allergic okay. to anything, so you given the right antibiotic to start with at the time of the operation. Now it's already half an hour gone, and you still got some oozing, and the anesthetic colleagues asking you to hurry, get on. What do you do next? So this, this, if it is, if the coagulopathy is related to sepsis, it could be, uh, yeah, the uh, coagulopathy related to sepsis. Hmm. Uh, I, I think uh, in this stage, I, I need to stop uh, technically because it, it will not be uh, of benefit. So I will put it back uh, and, and, uh, ask the anesthetist uh, to optimize the patient mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and probably i will stop i will not proceed will close the uh, temporarily close the abdomen until the patient is uh, uh, properly uh, resuscitated uh, from the sepsis point of view fine so you've done the resection you're not done any anastomosis you're just packing the patient yeah yeah, I will, will, will. I will just uh, stable the bowel and keep it stable now, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 close the patient uh, temporarily. Okay. So when do you come back to theaters? Ahmed? It depends on the uh, how the patient is stable. So twenty four to uh, forty eight hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the patient is is more stable and managed from the sepsis. Okay. Any specific term you know for the kind of approach you're using now? It's the uh, yeah I know the term but uh, uh, 
Uh, it's not in my mind. <clears throat> okay, don't 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 worry, don't worry, Ahmed, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. So you want to come back after forty eight hours? What do you yeah. do in this time, Ahmed? Yeah. What's happening to the patient? You close the I abdomen. Just, you're going to come back in forty eight hours. What's happening in the forty eight hours? So the patient will go to the ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, he will be had uh, on on supportive uh, care, fluids, antibiotics, uh, uh, blood products if needed, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 manage the sepsis and acidosis. Good, good, fine, Mohammed. I I'll stop you there, Mohammed. Yeah. So okay. I can sense that you're very uncomfortable with the scenario. No, it's okay, but it's okay. Uh, yeah. I'm not fluent. I'm not fluent in uh, answering. Good. No, 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 you're right. It's you damage you control. Start it correctly. Not, you started correctly. correctly. The good thing is, you knew that the first thing for oozing is to be pack. Yeah. You didn't say anything wrong that I'll use diatomy to bust the area around the ureter. I will. I'll put a stitch because all those things are not not needed because you can damage the ureter. So you didn't do anything unsafe. When the examiner gives you a hint, the nurse wants to give you something. That means they're trying to make you think of telling something next. So you can do one thing. Packing is good, but if it's still bleeding, you can't pack and wait. Do the same thing again. Yeah. So as time passes, septic patients become more and more coagulopathic. So you just need to do that. Yeah. So this discussion or this scenario was basically to look at surgical hemostasis and agents for that. So as a surgeon, you you'll be asked something about. Uh, critical care, physiology, all this stuff. So as a surgeon, you should be able to verbalize in two to five sentences what coagulation means to you. Yeah? You said damage endothelium, platelet matrix, intrinsic external pathway becoming the common pathway to form a stable fibrin clot. You should know some key buzzwords to get you out of that particular question and then move on. Yeah. So when you are, when you asked about hemostasis, <coughs> You say energy device, then bio, uh, synthetic materials, which can be passive and active. Surgery cell is just passive. It's just layers of fibrilla, fibrilla stuff, which gives a matrix for platelets to settle down. And then the clot starts to form. So as you advance, you use various other objects, which can be flow seal, taco seal, uh, 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 fibrillar collagen, the powder you, you spoke about, you should know roughly about what you're talking about. Then that invites a question from the examiner. Then you can go down that line. The moment the patients, the examiner gives you a hint that patient is septic, what the answer I was expecting you from, from you was? Damage control. Yeah. yeah, no, before that, what I wanted was the major pedicles are tied well. I've got minor rules from the retroperitoneal bed. This should not cause the patient to become so unwell. So is there something else happening? Yeah, Have you missed a pulmonary contusion? Have you missed anything else in the chest? Look for other things. Tell you, tell you anesthetist that the bleeding is under control. It's just a minor ruse. Are we missing something else? Yeah, I'll go along those lines. Then the event goes down to, the la to either a cardiac event on table or a bleeding somewhere else, which you need to tackle. So when the next clue comes is, the patient is unstable, the anesthetic wants you to get on. Then use the right face. Now the patient has become unstable. I've tried to stop the bleed by using packs, uh, surgical hemostatic materials. It's still going on. So I, my approach is to change to a damage control approach. While I pack and close the abdomen, I'll tell my anesthetic to get blood blood products, get into the unit for optimization physiologically, correcting all the coagulopathy which is there and taking them back when the patient's got a better chance of survival and a better outcome and a definitive procedure. So just use some key buzzwords. Uh, as you go down the course, you will find that you find a huge amount of improvement in the way you structure your answers, then you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Man. You did well, don't worry, you, you did fine. So you didn't say anything which you don't know about, which is the very basic thing. I didn't want you to say something which you're not comfortable and didn't know the answer for the next one here. Yeah. Right, good. Who's who's who has not finished yet?
Sorry, I can't see all of you here. Um, I'm just going through the names. Anybody else wants to go next who's not got a chance? Uh, Vahil, do you want to go? Vahil, you didn't have a proper session. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. So let me just check. So, Vahil, your, your call to the medical wards while you're on call, you were asked to see an 8 year old gentleman who's got severe abdominal distension and is in severe abdominal pain. What do you do? OK. Um, first of all, um, I would um, see the patient take a proper history uh, from the patient and uh, um, speak with a medical consultant who is in charge or who is ever in charge of the patient, know about the history and why he has been admitted under the medical team and what's his past medical history. And then I would examine the patient, um, see what, uh, see uh, abdominal examination, digital rectal examination, and see what is related to his symptoms and then uh, see his bloods, check his bloods, what's his HB, what's his white cell count, what's his CRP, what's his lactate and uh, do an abdominal x-ray as an initial investigation and take it from there and maybe yeah. okay fine so he's a 70 year old chap who's been in the hospital for four weeks he was admitted with a stroke and he's on dual antiplatelets now so he's been, he's been almost in the bed for about four weeks now they just started to mobilize him apart from that he's immediately stable his white cell has is 20 CRP is 200, yeah. Okay, and he had a spike so, of temperature of 38 in the evening before you saw him. OK, so he he's bed bound. So I, I would examine him, as I said. And um, regarding uh, doing an x-ray, um, he's bed bound. So I would think about pseudo obstruction, that one thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, with this high white cell count and CRP, if there's any abdominal tenderness or not, I may proceed afterward to see the abdominal pelvis with contrast. OK. Uh, are you able to see this, uh, right? And, uh, uh -huh. Are you able to see now? Yes. Yeah. So that's abdominal x-ray you wanted. Yeah. OK. Tell us what you're seeing there. Looks like volvulus. It's very distant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll think about volvulus. Uh -huh. Very standard cooling uh, of mobile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll think about both those. Okay, fine. So you wanted a CT scan also, isn't it? Um, yes, I would do a CT yeah. scan, but just after maintaining, making sure that the patient is vitally stable and his yeah. blood pressure. That's, that's one blood. image given to you. Can you interpret okay. that image for me? Okay. So uh, it's not, yeah, it's not quite. Um, um, it looks like the, for me, it's like cecovolvulus. I don't know, cecovolvulus maybe or zygmoid. So there is a lot of air in the middle of the abdomen. That's what I can I see, and uh, a lot of stool. Um, So what do you do next? Uh, well, the image is not very clear. Anybody whom we can speak to? OK. Yeah, anybody else you can ask? 
You mean you're asking someone or you're yeah, asking yeah, someone? Yeah. No, for you, for you. I'm asking you, yeah. So, uh, what's the question, sorry? Can you, can you speak to anybody else? Uh, because because we, we, so, yeah, yeah, they know this. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, you speak to your radiology colleague. She tells you that the colon is grossly distended. There's a lot of fecal matter impacted in the rectosigmoid region. Although the bowel is grossly distant, there's no volvulus of the sigmoid. But she's more worried about the CT scan. She tells you that the colon is grossly distant CT scan. There is no perforation, but there is fecal impaction in the lower end of the sigmoid and the upper rectum. And there's some intramural gas in the rectum. And she's calling it circular colitis of the rectum. OK. So this patient has a raised white cell count and CRP and yeah. very distended colon. I would measure this uh, colon diameter. And I would think about toxic megacolon. That's my yeah. main concern here. Because the, the colonic diameter at the transverse colon is 10. At the cecum is 11. OK. Um, with, this, with this parameter and the, this raised white cell count and CRP, uh, I would think for um, um, operating on this patient because mostly he's having toxic mayo colon, which uh, was the symptoms and signs he's having, and this uh, grossly standard colon. Fine. The patient says, You do what you want to. I'm happy to go ahead. So you've decided to operate. What do you do next, Wahil? So it's, it's, uh, so it's 10, 10 in the night. You're seeing this patient yeah, who's had a stroke. Who's on dual antiplatelets? Yeah, what do you do next? Okay, first of all, uh, I would speak with the hematologist about the dual antiplatelets if we can reverse it or how we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. I would do group and save and to the patient and I would mm -hmm. do an LS score for him mm -hmm. uh, to assess the morbidity and the mortality. And I would speak with the anesthetist colleague to review the patient so we can have a discussion about what is the best approach to reach the patient. And then um, I'll speak with the patient about the whole plan we had made in place uh, regarding uh, the consent form that we are going, what the operation is going to be done. It is laparotomy plus or minus Hartman procedure that we may, he may end up with a stoma back. He needs to know about it. And uh, um, I will uh, consent him, telling him the risk factors of the operation, that there is risk of bleeding and there is risk uh, of also uh, um, bowel injury and all risks which is related to the laparotomy and then take it from there. Good. So the NELA score comes back as 20% mortality, and your registrar wants to do the laparotomy. What do you do? So if the NELA score is high, it needs to be the consultant surgeon and consultant anesthetist to be in place. Uh, he is quite old patient. Um, I would uh, take over for doing the laparotomy. Mm -hmm. It is 20% and he's a high risk patient. And uh, yeah, it's for the patient benefit. And uh, also, the time factor is very important, too. Okay. okay. Your, your, your anesthetic consultant is questioning your decision to operate because she's seen the patient. She says he's 78 on dual antiplatelets, stroke, has got other comorbidities. His performance status was three before admission. So she's just asking you to review the decision. What do you do? Um, I would review the patient again, and we can have a discussion again about the patient and speak with the patient and his family uh, regarding the decision and the benefit versus risks of the operation, and uh, try to uh, optimize uh, the patient as much as we can and inform the HD or ITO for post-operative management after the operation. And um, um, and discussion with, with the anesthetist again that I would I think it's for the benefit of the if I think it's for the benefit of the patient that he would go for operation then I would um, try to speak with her until we get into a middle place we can uh, have the best benefit for the patient. Right. Well, uh, what was your indication to operate on the patient now? You wanted a laptop. At 10 p.m., you mean? Or... Yeah, yeah. No, no. What made you decide to operate? Because the information given so far is there is no volvulus, there is cross distension of the colon, okay. there's fecal impaction, okay. 
the circle colitis? Um, so he uh, his um, his raised inflammatory markers were well, so kind of uh, mm -hmm. twenty and so high with CRP, mm -hmm. which is and also his spiking temperature. Uh, it's just this stage in which, from my point of view, is that the patient is going into sepsis. So you have to be deciding the optimum time to operate on him. Delaying the operation, yes, you can optimize the patient, but also can cause the patient to deteriorate further, and then it would be harder to let him see it. So it's like needing to optimize first from the sepsis to a certain point, giving him antibiotics, giving him IV fluids, um, discuss with uh, family and everything, and then take him to theater. Okay, very good. So I, I want you, you came to the answer of the last year. I just wanted to say that when you assess the patient, you start with the medical management while you plan the operation. Yeah, yes. But so, yeah, I, I'll put an NG tube, IV fluids, IV antibiotics, and yeah, yeah, urinary test. Fine, fine. Any other less invasive approach you can think of, Wahil? Yeah. We are, we are uh, not discounting a laparotomy. The laparotomy seems a little too too much at this point of time. Anything else you can do? F um, we can do a diversion as a, as a solution, but um, like transverse colostomy. Uh, this is many, if the patient is very unwell and he's mm -hmm. quite very unstable, then I would do uh, a diversion as transverse colostomy until he becomes stable and then see how it goes to decrease the pressure with the colon. Okay, fine, fine. So the other options flexible. Good. So you 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 start the laparotomy. Okay. Let's say that we agreed that to go ahead with the laparotomy. Tell us how will you proceed with the laparotomy while you okay so consent uh, is so done. Patient is in theatres. What do you do? Uh so um I'll drop and prep the patient, and then I would uh, open a midline incision. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the colon is distended mostly from, uh, you said, direct to sigmoid. So um, I would uh, mobilize uh, left colon and the sigmoid, try to identify the ureters and the gonadal, and secure them. And um, then um, I will mobilize to see if the cecum is viable or not, because sometimes uh, the cecum become necrotic or uh, maybe embedding perforation from the wide distension of the bowel. Um, uh, so it will, uh, if the cecum is like this, so we may end up with subtotal colectomy. If not, I will just do a limited resection to the uh, to the part of the bowel which is um, uh, which is uh, grossly dilated, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and then if we are going to do colostomy, I will do a uh, tracheal incision in the left upper quadrant, and left to left fossa, sorry. Um, and I will do an endocolostomy. Um, so regarding the resection, it will be, uh, I would use an energy device like a ligature, try to go through the mesentery, and then use a TLC stabler to secure both sides from the lower part of the rectum and the upper part of the left colon, and then take the specimen out and then do the colostomy in the left side. Um, Fine. I'll just stop you there because time has run out for the scenario. Yeah. Okay. Anybody who would do anything different? Yeah, there is no role for uh, just uh, try to give him enema before taking him to surgery. Yeah, good. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. So would, would uh, uh, sorry, uh, would would colonoscopic decompression be uh, or flexisic decompression be too much considering this intramural gas? And high chance of perforation, or would that? Yeah, good. Anybody else? Any other ideas? Yeah. Yes, Ravindra. Yeah, what do you what would you do? Uh, just you have mentioned about the cecal diameter, 11, 11 uh, centimeter. It is more concerning uh, than uh, this obstruction. Is is it like a closed loop ob obstruction? Yeah, it could be a closed loop. Yeah. And whether we have to take the uh, do the total colectomy, and uh, what about the inflammatory markers, WBC? This because of the either ischemic colon, colon is no, we, we, we had given inflammatory markers, yeah. So, I'll, we'll just go back to the scenario. So, Wahil, you will pass the scenario, away. there's no problem with that because you've done most of the things correct. What I would expecting is when you see when you're called to a medical ward, you'll review the records and then examine. I think you didn't mention about examining, you went to the inflammatory markers and all that stuff. 
No, I said abdominal examination, digital rectal examination, and see how they're doing generally. Okay, fine. So when you when you're given a picture of sterile colitis, and you need to decide what to do next, I, you start with the first thing. Given the white cell count, sepsis, and sterile colitis, I'll ensure the patient is frustrated. Antibiotics are started, fluids, NG tube, and then review the patient. At this point of time, patient does not need a laparotomy, but I'll have a low threshold for observation. What this patient, in my view, needs, you just say in my view, needs is a digital evacuation, closed observation, and see how the patient responds. Most often in the medical wards, the problem is fecal impaction. Sterical colitis by itself is not a reason to operate. You can find some intramural gas. If the patient deteriorates despite you doing the medical part of it, then you can jump in for surgery. If the examiner is giving you a scenario, patient has got rigidity, free gas on the scan, and lactate is high, then you he's trying to drag you down towards the laparotomy. Or when they give you a hint that the anesthetist is not very keen with your decision, just say, okay, fine, you can review it. Yeah. But if you've got any strong views that you have to operate, then stick to it. Yeah. Don't say I'll operate and then say that change your mind that okay, fine, yeah, I'll give an enema and see. Because both decisions are at each other ends of the pole. So offering surgery first and then going back to enema is not a not the right way to go forward. If you think there's a serious error in your judgment for that particular scenario, just say that looking back, I realize my answer was wrong for that scenario. If I get a chance to correct myself, I would do this. Just say that you you know what you're doing and you, you give a chance to the examiner telling that you're not shifting because the examiner is forcing you to do it. Yeah. All right, good. And when, when, when they say, when you're given a chance about everything is done, you're ready to start a laparotomy, just start like what you do. Because the NLAS score is high, it's a concern-led operation. I'll ensure that my anesthetic concern is that. I will do the WHO checklist, which we all of us do. Then warn them about the possible need for staplers, energy device, like you rightly said, blood and blood products. I'll keep the patient lithotomy legs up position because there's no point in trying to do a heart mend and leaving an impacted stool in the rectum. Yeah. So if you say all that, that makes it much more slicker. It takes you from just passing to a higher score. Yeah. I'll say laparotomy. At a laparotomy, I'll do an exploration first. Assess the colon, like you rightly said. Use the key buzzword, assess the colon, assess a small bar, look for any pus then decide whether I need to do just do a heart mix or a subcortical colectomy. And okay. say, once I reset the bowel, I will go out there, I'll get my register to evacuate the rectum, just check the rectum is okay, then staple the distal end, whatever you say, you finish the laparotomy. Good. Anybody else who's not finished yet? Just a question. Um, yeah. Uh, so you said, is anything, uh, you asked the question is if there's anything else can be done. So, what is the answer for this question? Is it like to go for the medical and trying the enema and trying the flex? Yeah, yeah, correct. Not? What I, the, 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 everything, Vahil, depends on what is given to you at that particular time and you make a decision. Yeah. So, the, you've discussed the CT with your radiology colleague. She's told you it's not a volvulus. She's told you there's no perforation. It is just a massive impaction with some intramural gas and features sterical colitis. The moment sterical colitis comes into picture in a patient who's bedridden, most of them need just antibiotics, medical management, uh, resuscitation, then evacuation of the rectum, like Ahmed rightly said. If the examiner gives you that perforation, uh, closed loop, all those buzzwords, then you say that you will have a laparotomy. If you want to be slicker, I will start with this, but have a low threshold for surgical intervention if the patient deteriorates or does not improve as planned. Okay. okay. And when you're dealing with a laparotomy for a 70 year old, I'll say, I'll get my anesthetic colleague to see the patient. I'll get my register to do all the bloods, including a la blood gas levels and all that stuff. Then say, 
I'll get the ITU team to review the patient because they're going to take the patient after the operation. I'll also try and speak to the primary consultant, the medical consultant, what are the views are. Yeah. The patient might have advanced directive, which we are not aware because you're just seeing the patient now. So put up all this out, to, out in the examiner just to say that you're not alone. You work as a team and you know how to approach things. Yeah. Because the moment you say laparotomy, it takes time to get things to organize. Yeah. Uh, your your Reggie will be speaking to the uh, hematology team to how to reverse the dual antiplatelets. At that time, you use your time to speak to the primary consultant in charge. Is there something else that you're not aware of? All these things come into play. Yeah. So, when when you if you want to be even more slicker, as I go to see the seventy year old patient, I review the records. I'm keen to know what's the patient's performance status. What the was it was the patient is a care home resident or other comorbidities if the examiner jumps at you why do you want to know it may be a surgical abdomen but it will help me to make my decision better if i know a little more about the patient since it's the patient in the medical ward i will i may not be aware of all the medical comorbidities which will influence my decision making yeah? so just use the right way of phrasing it they'll be happy with it yeah. right Mohammed, are you have you finished, Mohammed? Or I think they are done. Hi, Kalyan. Yeah, Kalyan, I can't see you, Kalyan. Hi. You're not finished. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, so can I, are you are you a colorectal trainee or? Oh uh, no no I will appear at the international APRC set uh, coming November. Sorry. I will appear at the International Leprosy coming November. Oh, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. So it's a very simple scenario for you. You finished your operation, which is an inguinal hernia repair. You're doing the sign out part of the checklist, and the nurse says there's a big burn where the dathomy was put in. What do you do, Kalyan? Okay. Uh, so it's a uh, hernia so operation. You're stuck at the sign out part of it. Patient is still on the table. The nurse has just peeled off the pad and she says, There's a big diatomy burn. What do you do? So, uh, okay, I will uh, first I will attend uh, this uh, patient and to see uh, how much burn it caused and uh, what the uh, type uh, of injury is it full thickness burn or is it superficial burn? Uh, then I will uh, uh, I will take help uh, from my uh, uh, if there is any uh, colleagues from the barn department I, I can take help uh, at the same time uh, uh, at the same time uh, I can put some local uh, dressing or do some debridement as uh, necessary uh, uh, yeah. Fine. It's, it's, it's just a fresh burn. It's partial thickness. Uh, your dressing point is fine. What did you do next, Kalyan? Okay. Patient is now so, in recovery. Uh, after uh, after recovery uh, from anesthesia, I will uh, inform the patient about that um, events that should not have been occurred. Uh, it uh, has been occurred uh, in diatomy burn. I will uh, t tell him uh, about the uh, about what could be done now, and mm -hmm. that should not be happened actually. Well, why do you need to tell the patient, Kalyan? The patient has signed a form for many complications. What is the need for you to tell this to the patient? Uh, uh, I will tell the patient uh, that it's a un uh, it's an unwanted event. Uh, it uh, happened. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm asking you, why is there a need for you to tell the patient about this? Okay, so in uh, uh, that's the uh, duty of candor, uh, right, I yeah. think. Yeah. So, so what, what does duty of candor mean to you, Kalyan? Uh, duty of candor means if uh, some things uh, that needs have happened, uh, suppose we are doing the wrong side operation or uh, accidentally we put a gauze or morphs into the abdomen or even uh, sometimes uh, doing lap polycystectomy, CVD is getting injured. So it's my duty to inform the patients that 
in that things have, have been happened. Okay, fine. You told the patient, patient is very angry and she wants to talk to you later. So what do you do next? Now the patient is sent home. What do you do? Mm, okay, so um, I will uh, just uh, reassure him and talk, uh, I will talk uh, to, um, I will calm him. I will try to calm him uh, as it happens by mistake. Uh, no, Kalyan, sorry. Kalyan, the patient has gone home. She's yeah. angry, but she's gone home. She's okay, stable. She's gone home. What do you do next? You finish the list. What do you do next? So uh, I will, uh, uh, I will just um, uh, advise him to follow up in the outpatient uh, department. Uh, okay. To, Fine. You uh, will set up an appointment for her in the clinic. What do you do next? Uh, and at the same time, I will inform hospital authority that uh, this type of uh, event has been occurred. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, and, fine, uh, fine. Yeah. Okay, Kalyan, I'll stop you there, Kalyan. Yeah, we you expecting this, Kalyan, or uh, <laughs> no, no, good. okay, fine. Yeah. Good. See, sometimes clinical governance questions are very important, they're very dry subjects, but you should go through the steps of it. Yeah, so commonly it will be a error or a un unwanted complication happening, so that's where they check your honesty, integrity, and your maturity as a consultant. So while you're doing the timeout, you're doing the sign out, basically, sorry, you're doing the sign out. The moment the pay, the nurse has told you that, the, just uh, this is what I, uh, how I would approach the answer. It's an unfortunate event which has happened. I will ensure that it is recorded at the sign out that this patient has a diatomy burn. I will ensure that the diatomy pad and the Pencil tip is kept aside for the company authorities to look into it. I will document in my notes very clearly that this is an uh, event has happened. Then in the recovery, once the patient is fully alert in the presence of the next of kin or another staff nurse, I will tell the patient what has happened. It's a she, by the way. You were talking about he, I was talking about she. It commonly happens in the exam. Just remember the sex of the patient who is who's being told to okay. you. And at the end of my list, when there's a team debrief, you know, we start the brief in the morning, there's a team debrief in the evening. I will discuss the incident again and ensure that everyone knows that this has happened. Once I finish my list, I'll put a datix form against myself and the team to look into this in an impartial manner and see what are the learning points for the entire team. Even though the staff nurse has put the pad, it's your responsibility finally. So you do that and you you set up an appointment for the patient to be seen in the clinic and you tell them about what has happened. The good part was what you did was you assess the patient and you put a dressing. First, ensure that the patient need, gets whatever treatment is needed for that particular event. I would even go back and say that. In the, I'll probably get the plastic surgery reg who's around to see the patient to just ensure that I'm not missing a full thickness burn. Because how many burns do you see as a surgeon? We, I, I don't see much of them. The plastic team are better qualified to do that. Since there's going to be a future potential complaint, I'll get the plastic surgery reg. Even a reg is fine to come and see and say, this is what has happened. This is OK. This is not OK stuff. Then at the next audit meeting or m, &M meeting, you can talk about it. And whatever the learning point is, I will take it on board and ensure that the entire team knows about how to rectify it and so that it doesn't happen the next time. So if you say all this, it makes it much more slicker. It tells you that you understand what DTF candor is and how to get around that event. OK. Anybody else wants to add? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on, Kalyan? No, no, please. OK. Good. Anybody else will do something different? Uh, I just have a question when you said that the patient went. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. When why, you yeah. said that the patient went home and she's angry. And yeah. so what what will be done next? Is it like a follow up with a smart team? Or yeah, but, but very good question. 
you set up the clinic for your own follow-up visit. When you see them in the clinic, if the scenario continues like that, you just say that, I will treat this like a potential complaint until the patient complains. When I see the patient in the clinic, I'll be entirely honest about the entire event and say that I've instigated a serious incident report against this, and the findings of this were one, two, three. It was an event which not have happened since the patient's event. There has been a new plan which is put in place wherein the surgical reg or the surgeon checks the diathermic pad. That is my practice. That's what I, we do now. And I'm really sorry this has happened to you. It's a never event. You can reach out to PALS if you need. And please be assured that the lessons we've learned from your case is this. And these are the measures which are put in. Do you want me to ask? Do you want me to ask any questions? I can. I'm happy to answer you. Any further information, you can get back to my secretary, and I'm happy to see you in the clinic once again if needed. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So when you hand anybody knows about how to handle a complaint, since he started this, we'll go on to that one. You get a patient who's complained against you. Let's say you've done a lap appendix. The patient is very angry with the outcome. He has complained. What do you do? Actually, do you want to take this, Atri? Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, young male I, software engineer. You've done a lap appendix. He's very unhappy. He's complained against you that he's not happy with the quality of care he's received. So, what do you do? Um, first of all, I will um, speak to the patient, assess him, uh, find out what exactly uh, his complaints are, mm -hmm. um, allow him to express one all his um, uh, 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 complaints, and mm -hmm. after listening to him, uh, address each individual um, concern, whether it is uh, just a strict medical concern, uh, mm -hmm. uh, apart from that, whether it has been his quality of hospital stay, or mm -hmm. whether there has been any other uh, complaint, including how he was treated by uh, mm -hmm. hospital staff, mm -hmm. and if if uh, once I record all those uh, complaints, I will say that one he can. Uh, so it has already been uh, given to PALS, or it is a yeah, it's, it's, it's a formal complaint which is comes is to PALS. All right, yeah, all right. Um, so um, uh, yes, uh, I I will say that I will um, order an investigation as to why um, this particular event had occurred, uh, and. Um, uh, keep him informed of all all updates uh, as to um, why uh, this has occurred, as well as to what steps we have taken to rectify the situation, and mm -hmm. assure him that this would not happen to any other individual. And mm -hmm. um, if if I could ask him if there is anything that I could personally do in my uh, competence or ability as a uh, professional staff member to alleviate whatever complaints uh, he has. Okay, his complaints are that he was kept for four days despite an appendicectomy. And in the records, it's mentioned that the SHU has done the surgery, and it was not you who was operating. All right. Um, so I would, I would uh, first look at the notes as to see what, what was the reason. Uh, first look at the operation note. What were the difficulties that were encountered in the operation? Uh, subsequently, the individual, the, the daily progress notes as to why the uh, patient was kept for longer. What did he have? Some form of ileus? Did he have uh, uh, excessive pain post surgery? Were there any other uh, problems that were um, encountered? And then address each one individually, and um, uh, subsequently ask him if he's satisfied with these answers. If not. Um, um, Take take uh, whatever his complaint uh, forth accordingly. Fine. Good. Anybody who wants to add anything more? Um, I would add um, yeah. because you asked the question was two parts. The first part was why four days, and the other one was you are not the one who operated. Yeah, yeah, good. So regarding the one you you are not operated, so I would just discuss that. Um, Whoever I'm, uh, I'm in. The, I'm in charge for him for who operated. And if I think he's not competent, I wouldn't let him to do the operation. We are all surgeons. Yeah, very uh, good. Like he needs to be very competent, so I can yeah. rely on him to good. do the operation. 
Good. And I think Lazar is for staying for four days. But was the question staying four days before the operation or after the operation? Well, after, after, after the operation. After the operation. After the, yeah. after the operation. Yeah. Okay. So. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Anything else? Fine. Good. So the when you when you're handling a complaint, just use the buzzword of. Usually, don't get the complaint immediately. It'll come a little later. So I'll have to refresh my knowledge of what's about the case. So I'll go through the notes, and I'll look into the trust policy of trust guideline of responding to a complaint. I think it's 28 days or something. Just check that bit so that you have to set up a meeting. I'll prepare the notes for the meeting with the patient and the next of kin. I'll ensure that one member of PALS or the surgical service is present with me while the meeting is happening at the patient's convenient time. I'll first look into that all the clinical needs are met with looking at the histology report, looking at how the wound is, how the patient is. So once you're happy that you're not missed anything and the clinical needs are met, then you will start by acknowledging that there's been an issue, apologize, and then look at the story, what they want. There are multiple models of it you can follow. I think one of them is assist model. You need to know about, you, you can have one of these models you can use here. It's It'll be acknowledge uh, story, then inquire, then solution, then travel. Yeah, but it means right from point one to the end point. Yeah, so you just have a framework as you talk through. It'll make you much more slicker, so that you don't miss events. I let the patient tell the story, and then inquire. These are the issues, which is basically the SHO was operated, and the patient was there for four days after the operation. So say that. I'm really sorry for the discomfort which has been caused to you, but going back to your first point of contention, the SHO being operated, it is standard practice in the NHS for trainees to operate and to get trained as surgeons. But I can assure you that it was not done on his own. I was there for the entire surgery. I was supervising him, like Wahil said. Yeah? So it is not done by junior doctors. It is done under the supervision, which is part and parcel of NHS training system. At any point, if there was a need, I would have definitely taken over the bit and you've done your surgery, but your surgery went well. Going back to the point of staying back for four days, it is because your surgery was done quite late. We had to keep you for observation. Going through records, you'll find something. Yeah, well, complicated and complicated. I list like you rightly mentioned, then you were discharged. And then say, is there anything else you would like to know? Or are you happy with the explanations given to you? And then you say that, I'm happy to follow you up and set another meeting to talk to you if you need any further clarifications. Or if you want to see any of my colleagues, I'm happy to arrange that for you. But I will see you in three weeks' time or two weeks' time if you still have any questions. I'll just finish that here. Just have just check for complaint handling because that can be one potential area which can cause which can give you a scenario question and you can score fully with that so talking what all we've talked about is everyone would, would more or less say that but if you have a structured model this is the model i follow to answer complaints which is simple structured so that we don't miss on any other points i follow the assist model which talks about acknowledging the problem first not hiding it then going through the story then looking for solutions so that we reach a middle ground, then inquire with the patient what else is pending, and then traveling with the patient until the journey is over in terms of that particular event. Yeah. You can stick to any of them which you find which you find easy to follow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Doctor, just yeah. one yeah. question. So in this scenario, uh, since it was just stated in the question that it is the SHO operating and yeah. details of the operation note were not uh, Told yeah. to you in the beginning, is it all right to assume that because no, you no, don't, don't, don't assume, you okay. say yes. Okay. Can I know the operating notes? Okay. Or can I know was it a simple operation, was a complicated operation, was there a drain place? They'll give you the uh, okay. answers here. Fine. Anything else? I think team will stop today, guys. Any any feedback or anything you, which is not clear? Sorry if I've been a bit rude to stop in between people or to give feedback, but this is the right way to go forward. Yeah. 
Yes, Ahmad. Yeah, you got something to say. Yeah? I just want to know if uh, if we can have uh, before before uh, registering to the to the actual course. Uh, do we have any access to uh, samples from the lectures or the PDF notes that will be available later in the course? I think, I think money has got. Uh, we will set up. There's a setup of resources. I don't know how the access is given, but you'll have the library resources to access to. But no, no, I, mean, what I would can, say can, is, can we get a, like a sample of this now before before registering to the actual course? Of a sample of what? Sorry. A sample of the lectures or the or the PDF notes uh, that will be available. Uh, you can you can just email uh, message to message in the group. Money and the okay. team will will see it to see to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, the short answer is yes, but I just need to see what the legalities are about giving access. Yeah. Thank you. In in case I don't meet you again, Tim, you're all good. You know what the subject is about. None of you have made any schoolboy mistakes wherein you'll get penalized. All the exam, this course is, if you go to any course, don't go to the course for gaining knowledge. Yeah? Uh, knowledge will not be spoon fed at this level. It's basically to re refine your technique of delivery to meet the standards of the examination, that's all. The examiner sitting there, he or she is also human like us. They'll have 20, 30 candidates going to saying the same thing. I'll get the history of look at loss of weight, loss of weight, and they'll get bored about it. So as long as you follow a structure <clears throat> and you don't miss on points, you have got your delivery perfected, you'll sail through the exam. So again, you don't need to know too much to pass the exam. As long as you know the basic stuff, the technique, you'll be fine. There'll be some scenarios which will be totally confusing. At that time, you may have to take a step back and say, I'm not really sure what this is about. But like, for example, while you said calproductin, I don't know the exact bi biological uh, nature of the protein, but I do know that it is checked in patients with IBD or inflammatory bowel disease to, to as a marker for inflammation to make a referral or to follow up the patient, something like that. To say that to, it gives the examiner, okay, this guy knows something, probably he doesn't know the definition of it. That's it. Yeah. Good. Anything else, team? Anybody who wants to ask something or say something? I think as the course goes, as you face more and more vivas, you'll find multiple examiners. I, I don't shout at people, I don't keep a very strict face. I encourage talking more. In the exam, some examiners are not like that. They won't even nod their head. They'll just sit there. You won't know whether you're going down the right pathway or the wrong pathway. They won't give much of indications. Some examiners will be very rude, interrupt every answer you say. Oh, they're not this. Okay, this, okay, this. So you have to you have to learn to get back to the scenario if the exam is interrupting too much. You you will get through that as you go through the course. Yeah. All right, if there's nothing else, then we'll call it a day. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.